All right, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of the Del Mar Foundation, I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's DMF talk. I wanna send out a big thanks to our special events chair, Julie Maxi Allison for producing our DMF talks programs, including tonight's presentation by Dr. Nadine Lamberski. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lamberski. She is the Chief Conservation and Wildlife Health Officer for San Diego Zoo Global. In that role, she oversees the Departments of Conservation Science, Veterinary Services, and Nutrition Services for both the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. She leads a team of scientists, veterinarians, nutritionists, technicians, laboratory professionals, wildlife care specialists, and administrative professionals to ensure the health and well being of the 4,000 plus animals at the zoo and safari park. And she also leads a team of conservation scientists, researchers, wildlife nutritionists, and wildlife veterinarians developing a comprehensive strategic approach to San Diego's Zoo Global's conservation efforts, overseeing the activities of San Diego Zoo Global through eight conservation hubs around the world. A key example is San Diego Zoo Global's work with the Kenya Wildlife Service and the Northern Rangelands Trust to enhance the health management of abandoned or orphaned elephant calves at the Reteti Elephant Sanctuary. Dr. Lamberski has participated in several field projects, most notably black-footed cats in South Africa, thick-billed parrots in northern Mexico, and desert tortoise in the southwestern United States. Most recently, I'm sure you've all seen her in the news um, in connection with managing the treatment of gorillas with COVID-19. Um, so I hope we'll hear a lot about that tonight. Please join me in giving a warm Delmar welcome to Dr. Lamberski for her presentation on gorillas, COVID-19, and a One Health approach. Welcome, Dr. Lamberski. It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Betty, and, and thank you, Julie, for this opportunity. It really is my pleasure to be here with you this evening. And I, I do have um, a couple of things to start out with. I, my talk has morphed a bit from the original title, but I'll just say that all questions are fair game, so you could ask me anything. And then I'm going to give you a, a smattering of information this evening, and I'm happy to come back and talk to you more about any topic of your choice that, that you find the most interesting. So I did wanna talk a little bit about our gorillas. It's been in the media a lot. And so I didn't wanna repeat a lot of things. So I'll, I'll summarize that situation and then we'll have a Q and A later. And then I do wanna tell you about um, our big news from last week, which is San Diego Zoo Global was uh, rebranded as the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what's behind that, about our conservation strategy going forward, which is very much a One Health approach. And the One Health approach really emphasizes that interconnectedness of the health of wildlife, people, and the environment to the health of our planet. So I will start with my slides. And can you guys see that? Probably not. Not yet, no. Uh, on here? Did I, hold on. I got it. How about now? Yep. Okay. Yep. All righty. So, uh, like I mentioned, we are now known as the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And this is really an exciting time in our 105 year history as, as an organization. We've changed our name several times over the years. In fact, we've had five name changes. So this is not new for us. And each name change was a major turning point. So what's changed now that's driving this new direction? The world has changed. And it's clearer now than ever before that wildlife health, human health, and the health of ecosystems are tightly linked. And for us, the pandemic has also pushed us to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we here to just participate in conservation or are we actually digging deeper, getting strategic and driving forward to improve outcomes for wildlife? We determined that now is the time for us to move forward with this renewed focus. So we're re-examining what we're doing and how we're doing it, as well as clarifying the outcomes we're working towards. So what you'll see today in this presentation about 
a little bit about our gorillas and about the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance is, is our continued evolution as we implement our new strategy and continue to grow our learnings and most importantly, our conservation impact. And I, I do want to uh, just make note that although San Diego Zoo Global has changed to the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, San Diego Zoo and San Diego Zoo Safari Park names are the same. The logo has changed. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit more to tell you the history behind that. But I know many of you came here today to hear the story of our gorillas. So this is Winston, 49 year old silverback. And right in the beginning of January, you know, right after the, we were hoping to come back after the holidays and open our zoo and safari park back to the world. And of course that didn't happen, uh, but something else happened. One of our employees uh, tested positive for COVID-19 and this person had access to our gorilla troop. And if you recall early in January, we had some of our first rain really bad rain and it was quite cold. So the, the employees and the gorillas were inside a lot together. And we all know we're not supposed to do that during COVID, but uh, we didn't know that, that the individual was positive at the time. Two days after that diagnosis was confirmed in the employee, Winston started to cough. In fact, he only coughed once and the alarm bells just went through, you know, everyone that worked there. We were all on high alert. We knew the chances of gorilla getting COVID were extremely high. And so without, you know, without hesitation, we immediately started to collect the um, most precious sample that we get from our animals and that's their poop. And we uh, collected as much poop as we could from that gorilla troop and had to get approval from the state veterinarian to submit this for COVID testing. So unlike or maybe similar to the um, frustrations over testing in people, as veterinarians, we can't just submit any tests we want. You have, to, you have to have approval from the state veterinarian. That's because all of the supplies were, especially in January, were hard to come by. Um, we, you know, they just didn't want massive screening of animals when swabs were in short supply, PPE was in short supply, the reagents were in soft, short supply. So we had to make sure that we had a legitimate exposure before we were allowed to test the animals. So that took some regulatory testing. We had our those fecal samples tested at the state lab, but that's not good enough for this reportable disease. And so we had, we had preliminary results. We got those on a Friday. We had to actually sit on those all weekend while they were sent to the National Reference Lab to be confirmed and, and that the original test was a PCR test. The confirmatory test was virus isolation and whole genome sequencing. So if you could imagine that was probably the worst weekend in a very long time for many of us as we, you know, kind of our worst fears were realized on, on Monday when we got that confirmation of positive. And so, so many things happened over that weekend and, and they had to happen simultaneously. So immediately we contacted the San Diego County uh, Department of Health and, and Health Services. And one of their physicians, one of their epidemiologists came out, well, I'm sorry, their disease control specialist to review our PPE practices and go through our donning and doffing of PPE and all the protocols we put into place to make sure that number one, our keepers stayed safe and protected, and then to maximize um, the chances if the gorillas were in, in fact positive. So this is the weekend before we knew of the con con confirmatory test. We, we wanted to make sure that if they were positive, they couldn't then retransmit that virus back to the employees. So this was a really, really sketchy time. So while we're working with the, the infectious disease uh, folks from the county, we're also working with our wildlife care specialists to make sure that they're getting tested, that their health is okay. We're collecting samples and getting diagnostics done on different individuals within the troop. We're having all their clinical signs documented. You know, every cough is, is marked, every, every bit of food and water intake, all this is recorded. Our veterinary team, immediately had to start thinking of how do you how do you treat a covid patient we you know this isn't in any of our books 
We didn't learn about this in school. So we talked a lot with our uh, counterparts in human medicine and got a lot of advice, great advice from the county. UCSD was fantastic in uh, how willing they were to share their experiences and, and uh, you know, just some options for us in, in taking care of the gorillas. And we had to think, you know, at this time, all, they, all we knew is the gorillas were coughing, but we had to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We had to very quickly realize this can go from, from, bat, from you know, not so bad to, to life-threatening in a matter of days. And we had to understand what our capabilities were to intubate and ventilate a patient. That was our worst case scenario. So fortunately that did not happen. Uh, we had eight members in that troop. We, we did collect samples on all of them at different points in time. The confirmatory test was only done on three individuals. That was the reference lab's choice. That wasn't our choice, but we do have PCR positives um, from all those animals. They're just not confirmed by the reference laboratory. And uh, we monitored them closely. You know, their appetites went up and down over the next several weeks. Their, they had some coughing that was not severe, but they, they were lethargic. They had um, some congestion, runny noses. And then Winston himself had um, what was what the keepers referred to as a greasy face. So if you look at his photo here, you, you can imagine that if he was sweating, if he had a fever, he might have kind of a dark sheen to his face. And, and we think that, that he was febrile at times. He was definitely the most affected. We were concerned that he has some underlying heart disease. And so we did opt to do a full anesthesia on him. We took this very seriously. Uh, we knew we could lose him under anesthesia. And we, you know, we were just so determined to, uh, you know, to understand what was fully going on with him so that we could give him the best possible medical care. The only way to do that with an animal, especially a gorilla, you wanna look under that hood, you have to anesthetize him. There's no other way to do it safely. So we did anesthetize him and uh, we're fortunate enough to have a CT in our hospital and he had significant pneumonia that we attribute to the virus. He also had um, heart disease, very severe heart disease that we think um, was, he may have had some pre-existing heart disease, but he had arrhythmias that have been seen in, in patients with viral myocarditis. So we, we were very happy at that point in time that we did anesthetize him and that we had this information so that we could treat him. Uh, he's now on cardiac medications and um, he's on a diuretic beta blockers and, and some other drugs and he's doing okay. You know, he's, he is 49 years old. He is um, you know, in those later part of his life expectancy, uh, but right now he's, he's doing okay. So we're really, really happy about his case. While all of this was going on, I had been um, in conversation with Zoetis, it's a veterinary pharmaceutical company, about a potential COVID vaccine. This started in January, I mean, in December of 2019. And then with the holidays, you know, we were like, yeah, I'll talk to you, you know, in 2020, a little bit more about this. We weren't in a position to need the vaccine at that time. But then the new year came and everything changed. So I got re in touch with Zoetis. They had just finished their uh, toxicity trials in, in the species they were working with. And they had um, 26 doses or 27 doses of the vaccine left over. And so we asked for that and they, um, they were able to, to provide those doses to us. So 27 doses, that's enough for 13 animals, two injections each. And, um, Fortunately, we did have one dose extra because we ended up um, needing that. We had one, one injection that, that didn't fully inject. So we were able to vaccinate uh, four of our orangutans. Five of our bonobos have received two vaccines each. This is a vaccine that's very similar to Pfizer and Moderna, but it's neither of those. It's actually a, a newer generation than those, those vaccines and it's made from mink and it, it will be, uh, they're seeking a commercial license to um, make that product commercially available, hopefully later this year. And they are going to produce a larger supply of vaccines for, for zoos and, and other 
animal industries that may be interested, hopefully in April and May. So as of this week, we are vaccinating three gorillas and one final bonobo uh, with their first vaccine. And then they'll get their second vaccines and that'll be the 13 animals. The reason it's taken so long to get all the vaccines into the animals is that, um, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to vaccinate everyone on the same day. That's not really good to use a, you know, a new drug for the first time on a whole bunch of animals at once. You know, you want to kind of test the waters a little bit and, and see if there's any reaction before you have 13 reactions all at one time. And then also, you know, we, we can't, um, we, we wanted to make this vaccination as stress-free as possible. And the only way to do that was for the animals to willingly, uh, voluntarily sit and, and get vaccinated. We vaccinate them in their shoulders. So they sit up against the, the mesh of their enclosure and they have a trusting relationship with, with their care staff, with their wildlife care specialists. And each of the individuals that was vaccinated just voluntarily sat there while it was injected. You, they had the option to walk away at any time and um, none, of, none of them walked away. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. It just, took, it just took a while to get all of that, you know, to get all those doses in there. So I did wanna show you, this is the vaccine that, that we used. And um, it, you know, it, it doesn't say Zoetis on it. I don't, she should have turned the bottle, but again, it's, it's, it says veterinary product in there. If you can, veterinary use only, just wanted to make sure we, Everyone was aware it's not the human vaccine. And then one of the first animals to get the vaccine was Karen, the orangutan. Karen, many of you may know if you've been to the zoo before, she's, um, she had heart disease as a baby and she had an open heart surgery and she's now um, far from a baby. She's uh, quite, uh, quite, quite advanced in her years and she's very special to all of us. And, and so she has been fully vaccinated. And we're, we're really, really happy that Zoetis was willing to share their vaccine with us. So I'll take questions in a little bit, but I wanted to kind of jump right into um, the Alliance. And I have to ask a question. Can you guys see my full slide or do you see the pictures, the little videos of all of us on top of my slides? I, well, I see your slide and then depending on how you have your views set up, if you have uh, on the right, top right corner, there's a button that says view. And if you change it to speaker view, that'll move all the speakers over to, uh, to the right hand side. But, what I, but, I, but in that view, I can see the entire slide. Okay, great. I'll just, I'll go from there. So conservation is at the heart of everything we do. And it starts with the connection we make with people and wildlife every day. So we, we changed our name, like I mentioned, to San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. We're an international nonprofit conservation organization with two front doors. We uh, integrate wildlife health and care, science and education to develop sustainable conservation solutions. And we're a team working towards a world where all life thrives. Our mission hasn't changed. Our mission is the same. We're committed to saving species worldwide by uniting our expertise in animal care and conservation science with our dedication to inspiring passion for nature. And again, our vision is a world where all life thrives. Our role is to be the most effective conservation organization for the world. For the world is really important for us because we want to serve the greater global community. We feel an extraordinary sense of responsibility and duty to protect our natural world. Our values are innovate, collaborate, inspire, and thrive. And these are the uh, key cornerstones that guide us and how we look towards the future. The four values tell a story. We start with collaborate. We work with several hundred organizations around the world that share our conservation goals and philosophy. They represent a broad range of government and nonprofit, corporate, private, and academic organizations to accomplish our shared mission of saving wildlife. And when we use the word wildlife, we, we are referring to plants and animals. We first have to collaborate, uh, which allows us to innovate. 
The expertise of our talented team is invaluable to our work and to our Alliance partners and allows us to innovate together as we serve wildlife around the world. We have two front doors, the San Diego Zoo and the Safari Park that are essential to fulfilling our mission. It is at our parks and online that we share our passion for nature to increase understanding, empathy, advocacy, and action for wildlife. When we collaborate, innovate, and inspire, we help people and wildlife thrive together for a healthy planet. And when we unite under this common set of values to collaborate, innovate, and inspire, we create a positive global impact for wildlife. So why the Alliance? We're reimagining how we lead as a conservation organization, using our diverse set of skills to drive conservation outcomes. These are the species that inspired our new logo, which is there on the right. The lion represents the founding of our world famous zoo more than a century ago. The rhino is the iconic species for the safari park, which is no place like it on earth. And the bird, which is kind of a hybrid between the California condor and the uh, Hawaiian crow or the alala, -la, highlights our ground groundbreaking work to save species and our commitment to conservation. We're changing our name to better support our mission, but it's important to remember that our alliance is more than just a new name and new visual identity. It's with our new brand, the new visual identity honors our organization's story. And that's the story that I, that I just went through. We spent more than a year analyzing our strengths and identifying where and how best to focus our efforts. We landed on eight hubs, which will anchor our conservation work, driving more strategic outcomes for wildlife in these regions. These hubs represent areas where we're currently most invested, and therefore we hope to have the greatest return on mission and vision. The hubs promote synergy and collaboration among internal and external partners and stakeholders. Our hubs will help us build on existing partnerships and collaborations, and have greater impact in the region. So these are the visuals that, that inspires our hubs. And also if any of you have been able to go to the Safari Park over the weekend, you'll see these two beautiful murals at the front entrance um, that uh, these species are also depicted in. It's really a beautiful painting. So these are our eight conservation hubs, Savannah, Amazonia, Ocean, Southwest, Pacific Islands, Asian rainforest, African forest and Australian forest. And each hub has an iconic animal species, a plant or an ecosystem depicted in the background, as well as a human silhouette. And this is really important because it sends that visual message of connectedness and coexistence. And conservation can only be successful if it includes the needs of people. We recognize and value the work we can do together with our partners. So I'm gonna quickly go through the hubs and I'm gonna give you just a couple of examples in, in some of them. So African species are well represented at the zoo and the safari park. And the savanna is an ecosystem where much of our conservation work is centered, particularly in Northern Kenya. So the African elephant and white rhino are the obvious flagship species for this hub. But we also work with lion, harola, giraffe, cheetah, vultures, and even cycads. Uh, we don't work with cycads in in Africa or in the savanna, but we do propagate those and uh, bank seeds on our uh, zoo and safari park grounds. This helps to impact, to increase our impact. And um, uh, this hub incorporates both our work in uh, Northern Kenya, as I mentioned, but also our work with the Northern White Rhino Project at the safari park. So I think many of you may be familiar with the Riteti Elephant Sanctuary. Uh, it was established nearly five years ago in Northern Kenya, and it's designed to rescue and rehabilitate orphaned elephants that have either been separated from their dams due to uh, natural disasters or, or poaching or, or, other, um, or other issues. Once they're old enough um, and they're at Riteti for usually almost close to three to four years, they're released into a nearby sanctuary. And we have teams both um, at Riteti and in the sanctuary 
that monitor the behavior of the elephants, their relationships with each other, and collect a lot of data using satellite telemetry and, and camera traps. This is our postdoc, uh, Dr. Stephen Chege, uh, who's examining this elephant calf. Dr. Chege uh, is a phenomenal, phenomenal veterinarian who has really helped to improve the care of, of the elephants at Riteti. We've been able to provide basic laboratory equipment and not only just provide equipment, but have um, some of our staff members have been to Kenya multiple times to train the staff at Riteti how to evaluate blood smears, how to check for parasites, how to do a urinalysis. And those folks have also come to San Diego to work with our team and teach our team skills that they have um, that could be uh, beneficial. One of those is this is the Riteti Elephant Sanctuary in Northern Kenya. And this is, um, this is a, a fairly recent photo. This was taken, I believe in April of 2020 after our team visited. Our, our team was there in March and they had to leave uh, after just a couple of days because of the pandemic. And when Riteti first opened, you may remember pictures where the calves would just run around and, and the, the staff would provide the bottles for them. Well, these little guys have, have just grown like weeds and they're, they're gigantic. And it's a little intimidated, intimidating to be holding a bottle up for a you know, several thousand pound animal that's charging at you. And so we used a simple technique that we use at our facilities to create a safe barrier between elephants and keepers. And after our team worked with them a little bit, uh, they came up with this barrier on their own, which um, is, is quite simple and, and inexpensive compared to this barrier, which um, you know, is the ones that we use, which is all steel, which is quite costly. Also in Kenya, we have a, a program called the Twigawa Lindsay. The Twigawa Lindsay Initiative was created as a conservation effort focused on researching and protecting the reticulated giraffe in Kenya. While it can be difficult to enforce anti-poaching laws, it's also a challenge to change deep-rooted cultural beliefs about wildlife. But change is possible. When local people can more easily provide for their families, Draft futures become brighter. Community conservation programs provide new jobs and opportunities for income and help shift attitudes towards wildlife from nuisance to part of the family. And this is really also exemplifies our efforts to promote coexistence in the region. We have another hub called Amazonia, which uh, represents a lot of our work in Peru. Uh, the jaguar is the, is the flagship species. But besides the jaguar, we work with Andean bear, a yellow-tailed woolly monkey and giant otter. The critically endangered yellow-tailed woolly monkey represents our work with numerous primates throughout Amazonia using new conservation technologies. And this technology, we call it laboratories in the jungle. It's where our team goes in and sets up molecular diagnostic labs that are portable with using you know, very small I won't say not inexpensive equipment, but relatively inexpensive equipment that can uh, test DNA to look at the biodiversity of species in the region using in the region using biological samples or environmental DNA, and then they can also test those same samples for pathogens or, or diseases, so that we can really learn about um, uh, what's going on in that ecosystem. And it's not just the you know, the, the technology that, that is of interest to us. It's the ability to transfer those skills to local universities and local communities so that they are equipped to do this themselves. It's not us going and extracting those samples out of the country or even doing the work um, in isolation from local communities or local universities. It's very much a, a capacity enhancement and anytime we work with local communities, it's always a reciprocal learning opportunity. And I, I'm pretty certain we learn a lot more than, than um, we, we pass on. The Oceans Hub will focus initially on polar bears. Polar bears have become an iconic symbol of climate change and the oceans are critically important to the health of our planet. The Hub's focus is climate change and the dependence on our oceans to absorb carbon and provide food. 
Polar bears spend most of their lives on the sea ice. They rely on it pretty much for everything they do from hunting to raising cubs, but increasing temperatures have led to a loss of sea ice, leaving polar bears without access to food sources critical to their diets. This in turn drives them ashore where they're more likely to come into contact with people, which is never a good thing for them or for us. The polar bear is a great example of the kind of issues we're tackling and how we'll focus our efforts as we move forward and work with partners, including Polar Bears International, Northern Polar Bear Institute and USGS, among others. This comprehensive approach addresses the loss of habitat, the impact of human activity on the behaviors of denning mothers and how humans can be part of the solution. The Southwest hub represents conservation in our own backyard from the desert to chaparral to pine forest. The desert tortoise and burrowing owl are flagship species. Other species include the tory pine, short-leaved dudleya, mountain yellow-legged frog, thick-billed parrot, my personal favorite, kino checker spot butterfly, Pacific pocket mouse, coastal scrub oak, wujum, and other species we're working with at the request of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This hub's focus is biodiversity hotspots, biodiversity conservation, both species and habitats, as well as habitat protection. We're partnered with the US Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and uh, we wanted to support burrowing, burrowing owl conservation. Burrowing owls are native species of North, Central, and South America, and in, including Southern California. The species was in a steep decline due to habitat loss, environmental toxins, and vehicle collisions. But beginning in 2011, we utilized satellite technology and GPS, among other tactics, to better understand where and how these birds live. The project fits into um, the Southwest Hub and exemplifies the work we do to benefit species in our own backyard. Our work has led to a number of hatchlings and we've seen birds that we've released successfully reproduce in the wild. And we are just about to um, release another group of birds in Ramona. We're working with um, the Kumeyaay Band in Ramona to, they actually just last Friday, blessed the, did a, um, a blessing ceremony of the release site. We have 10 of these aviaries set up and we'll be releasing 24 birds into that grassland habitat in conjunction with San Diego Habitat Conservancy. The um, Pacific Islands hubs represents our work in Hawaii uh, with Hawaiian forest birds, as well as a newer project on the Galapagos with pink iguanas. And we also do a lot of orchid work at our zoo and safari park. The focus of this hub is also biodiversity conservation. Since 70% of biodiversity loss occurs on islands. And one of the primary drivers of that loss is invasive species as well as habitat degradation. The, Afri the uh, Asian forest hub includes, the, some of the uh, key species are the tiger and the orangutan, including the sun bear. And um, the orangutan habitat at the zoo is one of our most popular zoos. And as an example of relating our conservation work back to our zoo and safari park, the, that um, habitat is a great way for us to tell our conservation stories to our guests. And we'll now be using these hub icons at some of our habitats around the zoo and safari park to help tell those stories. The African forest represents our work in Cameroon and the Embo forest. The species protected include gorilla, colobus monkey, and chimpanzees. This program has a really strong community-based conservation component. And this is, um, we met recently with some of the world's experts in grade eight conservation, and they were all very curious about our experiences with COVID and our gorillas. And they were trying to relate that to these field situations. You know, how will, how will um, COVID impact gorilla populations if ecotourism is started again, and what do we need to do to protect the gorillas? And my question you know, went back to that is, what do we need to do to protect those communities that then protect the gorillas? Because we've seen with COVID that, that healthcare and access to healthcare and testing and even vaccines is not uniform. And we wanna make sure that these communities that we work with that protect 
the precious wildlife and protect these forests that we depend on for clean air uh, also get the health care that, that they need. And just an example of, of uh, the trail cameras that we use in the Ebo forest, and that helps us to document the biodiversity that, that's there. And then the final hub is the Australian forest. And in this hub, we work with koala, platypus, Tasmanian devil, and the Lord Howe stick insect. So you probably, uh, many of you may remember that about a year ago, uh, there were those devastating mega fires in Australia. And in January of 2020, for the first time in our history, we used visitation at our parks to raise awareness and more than $1 million for disaster relief and wildlife saving efforts in Australia. We've been a partner for the Blue Mountains Koala Project for six years. So when 80% of that mountain region, which is home to more than 400 species burned, we joined the rescue efforts. Many of the rescued koalas that were taken care of at the Taronga Zoo have been reintroduced back into the forest with our support. We're very proud of that work. We also have uh, uh, programs which we refer to as our, our legacy species or their species that uh, they're part of our resume. They are our proof point that we can recover species giant panda, California condor, and Caribbean iguana are examples of those. And so again, this is another glimpse of, of our hubs and um, I, I'm really, really excited about the potential that we have working, working through them. So we practice what we call full spectrum conservation and that in that name alone, it, it implies that we rely on our partners. The Nature Conservancy is, is one of our strong partners, for example, and we just signed an MOU to work with the Nature Conservancy and Riteti Elephant Sanctuary. Nature Conservancy fills the gap where we work that enable our conservation success. I mean, we can't do everything and Nature Conservancy can't do everything. We focus very much on, on uh, wildlife, on plant and animal species, and Nature Conservancy focuses on protecting habitat. And so together, we really make a good team. So how we go about our, you know, you know, how we do conservation is we first look at, at um, the threats to sustainable populations. You know, what are the most pressing drivers of biodiversity loss? And these include things like climate change, invasive species, habitat degradation, human wildlife conflict, wildlife trafficking, and emerging diseases. And these are, the, these are the things that we focus on in the hubs. These are those drivers that um, are usually, I mean, almost all of these are, are human caused. And this is where, again, we focus our conservation efforts. And when I say full spectrum, we take this full spectrum approach. This approach is collaborative and innovative. It means that we address all of these five sectors if we wanna be successful. We want to promote health and mitigate threats to wildlife populations so we can safeguard biodiversity. We want to enhance skills and capacity of our local community partners so that in the long term they remain independent and are much stronger due to our partnership and not reliant on our partnership. Our intent is to partner with local community, share learnings, and further develop skills and expertise so that communities and wildlife that they share the ecosystems with can thrive. So this is an example of the full spectrum work in Northern Kenya. Another one of our partners, in addition to the Nature Conservancy is Save the Elephants. So Save the Elephants uh, focuses on securing critical habitat, mitigating major threats and enhancing skills and capacity. And we focus on also enhancing skills and capacity and promoting health and welfare. And this is kind of how we, um, we, we kind of sort out the conservation landscape, if you will. So what does San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance bring to the table? We, are, um, we practice conservation by using this conservation toolbox. It's what makes us truly unique. It's our multidisciplinary skill set of our very talented wildlife health and conservation science teams, as well as our nutrition team and wildlife care teams. And they make all of our work possible. Working together, we're able to customize a group that can tackle 
any conservation challenge or almost any conservation challenge that needs to be addressed. So not all of these tools are needed in all of the hubs. Instead, we handpick what's needed based on what the community needs or what our partners need or what the problem is that we're trying to address. And once we assemble this, this toolkit, uh, then we're able to get to work. We can't forget that conservation is first and foremost about people. Since the beginning in 1916, when Dr. Harry Wagerforth created San Diego Zoo for the children of San Diego, he made a priority to connect people with wildlife by, by providing one of a kind memorable experiences. And with the opening of the new children's zoo in October later this year, 64 years after the original children's zoo opened in 1957, we're introducing children to nature in a whole new way. And we'll develop in them an empathy and caring for wildlife that will help us create the next generation that will have a passion for our natural world and a desire to help protect it. So our, our messages are that, you know, we have these, these two front doors, our zoo and safari park, and they make our mission and conservation work, work possible. Our conservation work around the world demonstrates the importance and impact of saving wildlife and provides powerful stories to share with our guests. The synergy between work at home and work in our conservation hubs can help develop understanding and empower action on behalf of wildlife in unparalleled ways. So we have three messages. It's that we, um, uh, we save wildlife worldwide, we collaborate to solve conservation challenges, and uh, we are hoping you'll join us to be an ally for wildlife. And I'll just quickly go through those. Um, you know, we save wildlife through our, our wildlife care and health expertise, using our wildlife conservation and reintroduction experience. And then of course we use that One Health approach we address conservation challenges through innovation, collaboration, conservation partnerships, and that all important conservation toolbox, which are the, the skills of our veterinarians, nutritionists, and, and scientists. And we also wanna have a, a positive impact on our guests, ask our guests to participate and stay connected and be an ally for wildlife. Our global health has never been more important. We're committing ourselves to the health of life on earth, which means supporting global biodiversity. We're recommitting ourselves to our mission and vision, focusing on growing our conservation partnerships across our conservation hubs. We're continuing to champion the health of wildlife, ecosystems, and communities worldwide so that all life may thrive. So that's all I have. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamberski. And our first question um, comes from Don Mosher. Since he's Professor Emeritus of Immunolo Immunology at UCSD, I'm going to let him ask his own question so that he can follow up, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, on, on his topic. So Don um, Mosher, if you're still with us, please unmute yourself and feel free to ask your question and follow up. Don, are you with us? Let me see if I see him. Okay, I'm going to ask this question for him, uh, which is this, um, that he asked that he, he thought Winston got the Regeneron antibody to COVID-19. And is that the case? Winston did not get Regeneron. Winston did get monoclonal antibody. So uh, we worked with, um, uh, at, at the advice of, of some of the physicians that we reached out to, they said that if Winston had some underlying conditions that our best, our best time to treat him was before he really showed severe signs. So there's really this five day window that um, was going to be ideal to treat him with the monoclonal antibody if we wanted to prevent him from decompensating. And so it was very important to us that we did not divert drug from the human supply. So we were able to find a, a clinical trial that was no longer um, uh, going on and uh, identified some leftover monoclonal antibody from a, a, pharma a pharmaceutical company in Indiana. 
you know, whether we could have gotten, you know, monoclonal antibody locally, again, we did not want to divert drug from the human supply chain. So we went to, um, you know, something that was available for experimental use and um, used, used that on Winston. And, you know, we'll never know for sure if it helped him, but um, it, we know it didn't do any harm and, and maybe it helped. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, our next question. I, let me add just one more thing. Oh, um, I, although Don's not here, I, I wish he was because the monoclonal antibody is actually the same antibody as is in the the vaccine. So it's this the um, the protein to this to the um, the spike protein the antibody to the spike protein. So Winston got the antibody. Winston has not been vaccinated for COVID. None of the gorillas at the safari park were vaccinated because they've all been exposed and they were all sick at the time. So you don't want to vaccinate a, a, a sick individual. So those all those vaccines went to the zoo because they were also at risk. We probably will vaccinate Winston down the road. Um, he may have an exam in the near future and we'll be able to test his blood and see what his antibodies levels are at that time and whether uh, repeating a vaccine is would be in his best interest or not. Interesting. Uh, we now have a set of questions from uh, Julie, Maxie Allison. I'm gonna just ask them both and let you take them in whatever order uh, you know you would like. Uh, one question is, is the DNA of gorillas 98% similar to humans? And if that's the case, you might want to talk a little bit about what that might mean. Or, and then her next question is, how many staff work with gorillas and do they just work with the gorillas? So I'm not sure if the 98% is a trick question or not. I don't know the exact percent, but it's pretty darn close. Um, we are extremely closely related genetically to gorillas. But as uh, we were talking earlier, Julie, the bonobo, I believe is the most, we're most closely genetically related to bonobo uh, than we are gorillas. But, but that's a pretty small gap between the three of us. Uh, we're, we're very, very similar. And we, um, you know, we already know that gorillas and bonobos are extremely susceptible to viruses that humans get. Uh, we, our bonobos in particular are very sensitive to influenza and respiratory syncytial sens virus. And all of our great apes are vaccinated with the flu vaccine, the vaccine that is made for people. Um, they're also susceptible to measles. Uh, you know, we vaccinate for a variety of things. One question that, that has come up in some of the um, interviews I've done with uh, regarding the vaccine is, you know, why did you use a, a vaccine made for one species in a gorilla. And you know that what's interesting about that is I never thought not to. And the reason is that I'm a zoo veterinarian. So every vaccine I have ever given to an animal was made for a different animal. So that's just part of you know what being a zoo veterinarian is like. There aren't vaccines for lions. There aren't vaccines for zebra, elephants, gorillas. There is no, you know, there's there's no commercial value in that. So we extrapolate and we know that those vaccines aren't made specifically for an individual species. When a vaccine is labeled or licensed for a species, that's only because it was tested on that species. There's nothing magical in it that makes it um, work only on on dogs or only on people. You know, there there's some the technology behind vaccine is is pretty similar in veterinary and human medicine. Interesting. And, Interesting. and her, her second question was asking you about the staff that work with gorillas. How many are there and do they just uh, work just with the gorillas? Well, initially they did not work just with gorillas. There is about um, six people on that string. Uh, string is what we call the group of animals that they take care of. And they worked with gorillas as well as some other species as soon as we got the, um, we knew that there was a, a positive keeper and then of course our gorillas were positive. We isolated that team just to the gorilla barn and we put them in the, the Tyvek suit. So they, they really uh, upped their level of biosecurity to where they were like entirely enclosed just like you would see on, um, you know, on, on contagion or, or something. They had the plastic suits and 
face shields, the N95 respirators, uh, a, lot of, a lot of extra precautions were taken. And I, I'll also add that our keepers have been tested multiple times since then, and, and there have not been any other uh, confirmed positives. So we're very happy about that. Okay. Um, we don't have other questions in the chat box, but if somebody um, on this call would like to um, ask a question, um, you can um, unmute yourself and ask it if you would like. I'll give people the opportunity to do that. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say how much I like the uh, new name of San Diego Zoo Global. I really, you know, go, moving to that Conservation and Wildlife Alliance, it, it really makes a lot of sense in what you're doing and in what you're trying to achieve. And I certainly applaud you for doing it. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing all the things that are going to happen now. Thank you. Really appreciated your talk today. Oh, thank you very much for saying so. We are we're beyond excited. You know, we, we've been evolving in this direction for years. And, um, you know, the pandemic just gave us that gigantic push. Like, come on, it, the time is now. You must, you must change now. There has to be that, that emphasis on that connectedness. Um, the virus is, you know, the virus is just the beginning of the threats out there. And I don't want to end the, note, the night on a negative note, but climate change and biodiversity collapse are bigger problems than a pandemic. And, but some of the root causes are the same. And so we really need to, we really need to be holistic about bringing health back to our ecosystems. We need to respect nature. We need to take care of nature and let nature take care of us. Does anyone have a final question? All right, well, Dr. Lamberski, this has been a wonderful um, program. We're very um, interested in the direction um, that San Diego is um, formerly <laughs> uh, global is going and look forward to, um, to, to following your work and, and um, the work in all of these conservation pods around the world. And thank you so much for um, sharing with us and thank all of you for joining us for this um, uh, DMF talk. Thank you so much and good night to all. Thank you. It's my pleasure to, to see all of you, most of you, <laughs> and definitely to see your names. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank it you. was great. <laughs>